I'm Ronnie Lipschitz, Professor of Politics at Covington College 8, and we have two speakers, Ben Crow, who is the Chair of Sociology, uh, will go first, and Justin Mulvaney, who is uh, in Environmental Studies at San Diego State, and late of Berkeley and UCSC, uh, will go second. I just want to start out by saying that uh, Ben and I have a long-standing argument, debate, over the question of industrialization and ecological modernization, whether that is our salvation or, uh, I wouldn't say Malthusianism, but, but something, something around social and behavioral transformation. Uh, more about that. Uh, and, and I don't think we'll resolve it um, before we die, but in any event, it makes, the students always enjoy it. And I'm not gonna say anything else today, I'm just gonna time. Uh, okay. Time them, okay? So go ahead and start. Okay, okay should I take that? Yes, you should take this, and I will wave the yellow piece of paper. That's great. How long have I got? I got 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I must say, I've been very impressed with what we've had so far. Um, it's really been making me uh, rethink. Um, I think. Well, let me say one thing, that the organization of this conference has not been by faculty, it's been by graduate students, Costanza, Tiffany, Nino, uh, Adam, a number, quite a number, Susan, sorry, who? Yeah, Susan, yeah, yeah, Susan, all sorts of people. Um, so, uh, um, it's unpredictable. <laughs> and I've constantly been learning. Um, so, as I put my position, uh, I, I was, uh, having heard um, the opening by Harry E. Kim and Jeff Berry, I wondered very much whether my talk was right, but let me give the talk, and then, then, then we'll see. Okay, so, Industrialization in light of climate change. Um, so I want to make really two points, I think. One is that we have to think about industrialization. Second is that um, uh, a key issue of energy to deal, to provide some parts of development raises difficult questions for um, uh, climate change, and the way we think about those questions is clearly inadequate, and the way we negotiate about them. So, industry and energy are my two uh, issues, and. Uh, I think if, what I'm trying to summarize is the very early stage at which rethinking issues of climate, industry, and energy. Um, we, we've made a little progress, which is not reflected in the um, in, in popular thinking or international institutions. So I want to talk a bit about industry, then I want to talk about energy and the energy transition which I think is a helpful idea, um, and then uh, uh, conclude from that. So this is the basis of the debate with Ronnie, if you like, and with, in fact, one of my colleagues. Let me say that I, uh, this work has been done with a collaborator, Ali Shakuri, who's now at Purdue University, and Nick Janos, who's now at um, California State University, Chico. Um, so, the, the debate has been going on for a while, where I think industrialize it. Well, we agree that industrialization is a cause of greenhouse gas emissions, the core, the principal cause of climate change. I think, and perhaps my collaborators Ali Shakuri and Ronnie Lipschitz uh, may not agree with this, but it's also a remedy for greenhouse gas emissions. The reason, I have a number of reasons for thinking about this. Um, and the basic one is this, that 
industrialization bring, brings skills and capacities which enable much more adaptation and much more uh, response to uh, uh, all, a whole range of things, including uh, climate change and environmental change. One of the ways of dealing with this paradox is to go back to a basic uh, meaning of industrialization. Uh, there's a sectoral definition, but the key definition is a particular as industry as a particular way of organizing production, which enables a constant process of technical and social change. I think we need that constant process of change and increasing productivity. Um, and I think if one focuses on that rather than alternative ways of imagining industry as manufacturing industry or smokestacks or extractive industry, then we're in a position to rethink industry in ways which enable decarbonization and uh, reduction of emissions. So, in general, the reason why people in the development field have come round to a consensus which says that industrialization is a prerequisite for development is because it brings about a social transformation which raises um, living standards. There isn't very good research, contemporary research, there's research going back to the 50s, but contemporary research which looks at it in current conditions. So there's lots of room for work there, but it changes all sorts of things. People's skills, understanding of time, brings in education, brings in the state, brings all sorts of collaborative processes um, associated with industrialization. So there is a rough association between these various terms, unsatisfactory terms, poor, developing, third world, and non-industrial. I tend to think about the industrialized world, the non-industrial world, world like Africa, and the industrializing world. But I, but, but in my thinking about climate change, I will try to recognize that industrialization is a prerequisite for um, development. Development, again, at a very controversial, multi-facet uh, 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 topic. Um, I, I tend to think of it, at one level, as a set of different goals and different communities have different so, but industrialization seems to be important. Industry may be able to reduce greenhouse gases, um, partly through energy efficiency. And here I put up the classic graph, um, which is also known, a controversial graph, um, also known as the environmental Kuznets curve. Uh, this suggests that certain sorts of relationship between humans and the, uh, 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 their products gets worse before it gets better. Um, in fact, the, the controversy around this is partly that it may be an N-shaped rather than in, an inverted U, and at least for carbon dioxide uh, and greenhouse gases, the turning point may be uh, a, a long way off in the future. But the basic point of this graph is that a combination of various things, including technical change in industry and the growth of community action, uh, changing regulatory policies, seems to have this character of things getting worse and things getting better. And I think energy is likely, energy and emissions are likely to follow something like that. Um, so industry brings with it the capacity to manage emissions, it brings with it uh, regulatory capacity, and the possibility of transitions to services. One of the issues, again, of the debate is whether the in whether the reduction of 
um, uh, pollutants on the downside of the uh, environmental Kuznets curve is actually local or is due to international trade. I'll come back to that. One way of looking at the effect of industry on environment is to use the Yale-Princeton Environmental Performance Index. How many of you have heard of this? One, two, three, four, five. Not so many. This has been around for a while, also controversial, but it tries to look at uh, both uh, environmental health in terms of humans and in ecosystem vitality. I'm just going to put up a crude ranking. I'm not sure. Can you see this adequately? Okay, so this is just the top half of the global table. And what I wanted to say is that most of the countries, so the green are rapidly improving countries, the brown are rapidly declining countries, otherwise uh, indicated by the changing trend of ranking, but the rankings on the left are what I wanted to look at. And these are, uh, this is a, an aggregation of a series of reasonably sensible environmental indicators. What comes out the top? Switzerland, Latvia, Norway, Luxembourg, Costa Rica, France, Austria, Italy, United Kingdom, Sweden, Germany, all industrialized countries. Because industrialization gives them the capacity to, to clean up rivers. They may not do it, as happens in the US, to clean air, whatever. All these things come with greater productive capacity. Down the bottom, we mostly get less industrialized countries. The, the ones that move are particularly the Eastern European transition economies, which either made a, a mess and put the a mafia in control of the economy, or they got it a bit better and they began organizing. So they're industrialized countries that are unruly, if you like. So this provides my um, idea that industry can be part of the solution. Okay, I want to go on to energy and emissions. Uh, I want to introduce the idea of energy transition, see how that helps us think about agency, and maybe talk a little bit about energy justice. So this is a historical um, picture of selected countries from 1950 to 2008, their emissions per capita. Emissions per capita seems to be the best measure we have of level of emissions per person. What you see is the US up at the top, rising through the 50s and 60s, leveling off during the uh, 80s and 90s. Um, United Kingdom, this purple one, relatively level, at a lower level than, than, than the US. Um, this, uh, China, uh, this is South Africa, sorry, yes. The next one down, the light blue is South Africa. China is the dark blue at the bottom. Repub South, South Korea is the red one. And what's important about this, obviously, is that with industrialization, Korea's been going through a rapid process of industrialization. With industrialization comes increasing emissions. I think it's also interesting that Korea seems to be leveling off emissions per capita at the European level rather than US level. US is exceptional in emissions as in so many other uh, ways. Okay, so <laughs> this is the process of um, uh, change of industrialization. It makes emissions worse. Maybe it gives capacity to make them better in the future. Uh, I'm not, I don't have very much time, but one can see broadly in this rather unsatisfactory graph, China going up, uh, the industrialized countries going up and coming down in their energy use, mostly but not always, even the US going up and coming down. This is over a period of um, uh, 50 years or so. Uh, India and China just going up. So again, increasing use of energy, perhaps with a sense of declining afterwards.
So there's a hypothesis which comes from uh, a, a, a Grubler uh, in 2008 um, uh, about energy transition. And he's, he's got the beginnings of a very good idea. So during, we can see big processes, changes in uh, the, the, the relationship between human consumption of energy and the natural world. So a, a series of changes can take place. And this is drawing on an analogy with what's called the demographic transition. How many have heard of the demographic transition? Okay, most of you. All right, this says that as countries develop, or in fact industrialize, their fertility tends to go up and their mortality goes down, uh, which leads to a massive population increase. But then fertility declines with a set of complex changes in the structure of society, and there is a fertility decline. We'd like to think there's an emissions or an energy transition. It's not clear, but clearly big changes are taking place on a historical scale. Changes in the nature of uh, a, a, a fuel, structural shifts in the share of commercial fuel from private to uh, public and public to private, structural shifts and sectoral distributions in the use of energy, and perhaps most problematic, changes in energy density, quality, and productivity. Um, we get a good example of this from Grubler, uh, which is big transitions in the past. Here he's looking at transitions in the supply of energy, from biomass to uh, coal, and then to modern fuels, oil, gas, and electricity. Um, uh, but there are a whole series of changes going on. Renewables tend to be less um, dense in their energy. So um, uh, much more energy from a small area of uh, 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 oil, a small amount of oil, you get much more energy from it. For renewables, they're much more diffuse. So one aspect of the transition is the density of energy, which makes it quite difficult. Um, ah, I borrow this, this is nice. Okay, so I borrow a slide from a collaborator and it's got all sorts of little devices in it. Uh, his comparison is um, uh, 500 to 10,000 watts per meter squared is the spatial density of oil fields compared to um, two and a half watts per meter squared for wind. So part of the transition brings difficult problems. Another aspect of the transition, energy use in China at the moment is mostly by industry, relatively little, little by um, transportation and residential. If you compare with China and U US, you get a sense that uh, residential and transport uses are overtaking industrial uses. So, an energy transition is taking place in which different forms of uh, um, use are emerging. So a shift in sectoral use uh, of energy from uh, industrial dominance to residential transport dominance. My time is up. Okay, so um, part of the debate around whether energy, whether industry is becoming more um, efficient in the industrialized countries, whether industrial development is actually doing uh, enough to bring down emissions, concerns the transfer of the emissions through the offshoring of manufacturing production. So there's a recent study which doesn't answer the question fully, but suggests that about a third of the improvement in emissions from US, uh, US industry comes from offshoring uh, uh, manufacturing to China. 
so that we're, we're getting closer to an understanding of uh, some of this debate. I'm going to skip through some of this. Um, we have, uh, we're gradually, as research is being done, we're getting a gradually better picture, better understanding of where energy is used and where we can think about uh, applying change. Um, this is what's known as a Sankey diagram. It's very complicated and it's links to, uh, to empirical uh, reality are, are somewhat uh, unsatisfactory. But if we look again at my uh, colleague Ali Shakuri's simplification of this, what it seems to suggest is that um, uh, even that globally, about a third of energy use is still in industrial, uh, maybe half in building, and a, a third in transport. For the case of industrialising countries, think of this um, beige area being much larger. So one of the difficulties of the transition has to do with the size of the um, uh, emissions coming out of uh, industrialising countries. Um, we get an idea here of population against um, uh, energy, uh, uh, sorry, emissions, so that large populations in China relative, or India, relatively low levels of emissions. If you'll give me two more minutes, three more minutes, I will just put in one more point in this. So, one of the ways forward in understanding how to think about emissions is not to do as this graph does, which is to think about emissions as national properties, but to think about them as taking into account the um, disparity in income and, and consumption across countries, to, to think of them in terms of individuals. So this study has ranked individuals by their emissions. So up in this left-hand corner are the rich people in Shanghai, as well as the rich people in uh, New York and San Francisco and Palo Alto. And what that suggests is that a relatively small proportion of the population contributes a large amount of emissions. So national negotiations around emissions are problematic because what should be nego negotiated should be negotiating between the, the billion highest emitters. And this is what this paper by Chakravarti and others does is this is around a billion people getting down to one of the limits uh, suggested. And the point they make is that raising the lowest emitters, so energy justice, if you focus on the highest emitters, takes very little increase in the number of emitters to uh, improve uh, heating and lighting for the poorest people. So that's one of a set of uh, 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 results coming out of a different view of doing this. Let me conclude with this slide. The positive side of this sort of analysis is that we can disaggregate agency better in terms of thinking about emissions from states to particular sources, from individuals to, uh, 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 to MISO levels. And we can situate climate change in relation to other objectives. I haven't talked about the iron law. But the negative side is for emerging economies, the need for energy to industrialize is very substantial. And I would argue that needs much more uh, research to find decarbonization ways to provide the improvements in productivity 
transformations in people's lives, um, as well as the simple uh, the changes of investments in infrastructure. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to take one to take out away for their lunch. So thanks everybody. Um, Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the research I've been doing on is it microphone. Why is that? You guys Hi. hear me? Hi. <laughs> uh, so I've been doing research on solar energy commodity chains for the better part of five years, and you know, that goes from manufacturing to end of life. And today I'm going to talk specifically about uh, the industrialization of the West for solar energy production. And by industrialization, I'm talking about taking particular landscapes that are typically rural or wilderness area, and you're actually plowing very large parcels under um, scrapers and, and removing all the habitat vegetation and things like that to put something out to save us from climate change. Um, and I'll just add on to uh, one of the points that Ben made, made about uh, decarbonization strategy and actually point out a real big challenge here, which is that uh, <coughs> According to climate scientists, we have to get global per capita emissions down to somewhere about one to two. So that means somehow we have to be living our lifestyle of uh, emitting about what people in Bangladesh emit. So that's, that makes this challenge much, much more daunting than even uh, many of us think, it's, think it is. Uh, one way we can think about decarbonization is through this concept that sociologists and others talk about, which is ecological modernization, which is one of these ideas that they're trying to use to reconcile this idea that the, the aims of growth, or the ecological modernization is trying, to aim, is trying to reconcile growth with industrial development, and it has a couple of features that are pretty prominent in the literature. One is there's a strong emphasis on innovation, so how do we make technologies cleaner, emit less, things like that. Um, another important aspect is the greening of institutions, governance, and markets, right? So instead of brown markets, and Dirty energy markets, clean energy markets, uh, things like that. And then another important aspect is kind of a new role for civil society. So as opposed to the past when environmental organizations were protesting against particular facilities, now they're kind of jumping on board and collaborating with industry to try to change the way we do things. Um, and really, one of the big upshots in the e eco-mod literature is that institutional and technological innovations are critical to making all this happen. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, in the context of solar energy. So when we think about solar energy, a lot of us immediately will jump to the technological innovations, right? And that's partly the legacy of where it comes out of. It comes out of the iconic Bell Laboratories in the 1950s. Um, and then today, when we think about innovation in Silicon Valley, it's really the thin films that became the darlings of venture capital for the long time. That's where all the money was going. You get clean energy investments. It's all going to thin films. Um, and then we look even at government institutions. ARPA E is trying to model after DARPA, which gave us the internet, which Al Gore funded. That's how he makes that claim, that connection to the internet. Um, as well as the Sunshot Initiative. And then even Barack Obama, in his, I think it was his State of the Union address, kind of frames this moment as our generation's Sputnik moment. So thinking about innovation in clean energy in the context of the geopolitical race with China and Germany and other places like that. Now, more broadly, really what innovation means in the solar energy space is driving down the cost. So it's not so much about technological innovation, it's about things like supply chain innovation. So contract manufacturing in China is seen as an innovation and one way to drive down the cost of solar energy. Um, economies of scale is obviously important. Oh, there, there is this thing, it's called the Moore law, Moore's Law for Solar Energy, which is that every time you double the volume of PV manufactured, you drive the price down by about 20%, 18%, something like that. Um, so ultimately, it's not just technological innovations that need to happen, but other kinds of innovations in institutions to drive down the cost of solar. And we've seen a lot of these. So while a lot of us are sitting back saying, oh, there's nothing happening on climate change, We've sunk about $30 billion from the federal government into clean energy technologies over the last four years. Um, and some have called this, and, and I've called it in a paper in a somewhat disparaging way, uh, the Green New Deal. Um, and we'll talk about whether it's green or it's new toward the end of the talk. Um, renewable portfolio standards are really important. Right? These require utilities to buy green energy. 
and they're, they're usually at the state level, or they are all at the state level. Another, so, so that basically creates the markets for renewables. Right? And in this case, California, 33% by 2020. Another important thing, and Ben pointed out the diffuse nature of renewables, BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, often manages about 260 million acres of the West. They were given a mandate through the Energy Policy Act of 2005 to develop 10 gigawatts of solar on public lands. So, that, so, you, so you have the market, you got the land to do it. And then there's various financing schemes because it turns out that solar energy is very risky. Investors don't want to lend money to either manufacturer to power plants. So you got to come up with some creative ways, mainly through tax equity, um, to actually finance these things. And it's worked. So if we look at utility scale solar projects, well first, you know, we're at about 20%. So we've, we've met kind of the first threshold with the renewable portfolio standard in California. And if you actually look at projects in the pipeline, we have about four times as many projects in the pipeline as we actually need to get to that 33%. So some would, would, would say, hey, is, is that a, a speculative bubble happening there? Or what's actually happening in this picture? Right, so, so these institutions have been innovative because they have got companies, developers, committed to developing renewable energy. So this is a map showing you the BLM how the BLM responded to that mandate. They opened up about 21 million acres to developers in, in the West, and that's what's shown here in a map that's combining uh, those polygons with uh, solar insulation. And you literally had companies, well, let me go back to that. You literally had companies, every, everyone from Goldman Sachs parking themselves on large quantities of land to guys that were just nothing more than a Jeep driving around like marking land. So, these are the black dots in this are showing you uh, applications to BLM to develop solar power plants. The red dots are showing you uh, projects that were fast-tracked under a long history, but basically fast-tracked so that you can access some of the stimulus money that was made available in 2009. I'll just point out, you can see Goldman Sachs is sitting on a, a big portion of these parcels. First come, first serve paper. It's very complicated. On the finance side, one of the big controversial programs has been the Department of Energy Loan Guarantee Program. And obviously, if you've tuned into any debates, you've heard Solyndra drop in here. Um, and it has been very controversial for a lot of reasons, but uh, it, it basically provided a lot of the money that helped with all of these projects get built. It was headed by a former venture capitalist. So in terms of thinking about what innovation means, he borrows a lot of this kind of fascination with technology from Silicon Valley and brings that to Washington, D.C. So you don't quite see the model that China took in the solar PV space, which is to say, let's drive down the price through contract manufacturing. It was more, let's focus on thin films because that's where the emerging frontier in renewable energy is. And oh, and said, he actually, I have this quote from him in a press release, or in an interview, he's gonna run this thing like a shadow bank, essentially investing in things that the private sector won't invest in because solar energy is a risky thing. Now, they took to it a very, very linear view of innovation. So this is the way the venture, this is the venture capital model or, or the way that uh, innovation proceeds. So you can see um, this particular loan guarantee program was meant to carry companies through what's called the, the uh, valley of debt for solar or any you know, startup company, which is that it costs a lot of money to build factories and, and to actually build out a particular um, industry, and that's when you take on the most debt. So the whole idea behind this Department of Energy Loan Guarantee Program was that it would loan money to risky businesses so that they can actually carry themselves forward and become successful businesses. So this is a program where that's Lindra and Abound is another bankrupt company that got money through this. So if you actually look at how much money was loaned through this program, and many of this was leveraged against the Treasury 16 Free Program, which is another $10 billion on top of this. Um, we're talking about about $12 billion of loans, two of which have been defaulted on. And this is, I would argue that, that the Solyndra failure is more of, of a, a failure to incorporate industrial policy with innovation policy. So Solyndra's business model is to put things on commercial rooftops. We incentivize the hell out of utility scale solar in the desert. Of course, they're not going to be able to sell any panels. They're not going to keep competing those markets. Um, so anyhow, just wanted to flag that. Um, so how do companies get loans? Well, you had to actually show that someone had some skin in the game. So in this. So you had Bright Source Energy, who was building one of the more controversial power plants in the desert. 
they go in and they say, hey, we've got a couple hundred million dollars from Chevron, BP, Morgan Stanley, uh, CalPERS, uh, other groups, I'm sorry, CalSTARS, um, and basically they're able to get, you know, leverage that 200, 300 million dollars to get a 1.6 million dollar, a billion dollar uh, loan guarantee. And this is where I point out, um, you know, it's not quite a new deal if you actually look Dow, Bechtel, they have kind of histories of working as military contractors. In fact, the company that makes the heliostats that turn the mirrors actually makes, uses the same gearboxes to turn uh, army turrets, gun turrets and things. So if you're asked, is this a green new deal or is it new, um, the fact that the military contractors are at the public trough on this one suggests it's maybe not so new. So just to summarize up to here, really the context for these big projects is creating new markets, Socializing risky investments, right? And that's what these people who observe speculative capitalism say, that wealth moves one way, risk moves the other. And then these virtual land privatizations, where the BLM actually retained ownership, but they were leasing out these lands. So these were the three primary drivers for utility scale solar, which kind of foments in this big controversy over whether or not these are actually green. So if you actually go back and look at the literature on, from the technologist's perspective on Kind of using the desert to generate solar energy, you see a lot of references to the desert as wasteland, but in fact it's nothing like that. All sorts of endangered and threatened species. The most uh, charismatic of these being the desert tortoise, which in the Ivanpah project, the Bright Source project I showed you before, they had to translocate about 150 of these to a, a neighboring site. You can actually see the GPS unit on the top of this shell. And here, I mean, this, qu this quote really epitomizes, the, I think, the, the controversy. Should we save the desert tortoise or plow over its habitat to build solar power plants that can help us save ourselves? Right? And you'd, other activists would say, why are we destroying this habitat to power the air conditioners of Los Angeles or Las Vegas? And, and some of these impacts were actually real. So for one of these projects called Genesis, ironically, um, well, this comes more ironic in the next slide, um, they had a evict the kit box out of these sites. So they went with coyote urine, and now they have distemper in the kit box population for the first time. So, you know, not so green in that context. Um, there are a lot of actual biologists that I've interviewed who talk about the Mojave Desert as a biological frontier, right? So they basically say, we haven't actually documented what's even out there, so how do we know how to measure the impacts? And that's illustrated through this, this is the California Consortium of Herbaria records. These are plant vouchers, and it's showing you you look over in the area that's more dark and, and disparate with the little lights, um, that's just showing you there's not been documented, documentation of plants in those particular areas. So there is a bit of a biological frontier that's clashing with these power plants as well. In this letter, you will not find on the C, the California Energy Commission website has been removed, but uh, the division chief of U.S. Wild, Fish and Wildlife Service is concerned about the, the solar power towers, that's the Ivanpah project again, and their potential impact on birds, particularly golden eagles and, and larger birds of prey. So they're basically calling for a moratorium on citing new projects until we actually collect some data to understand these things. So all raising the question of, of whether or not this Green New Deal is actually green as we decarbonize. Um, a lot of environmental justice issues as well. The Genesis site, which I'll point to over there where that little cross is, they actually, you know, despite my interviews, I've, you know, I've Native American groups were telling me don't build near watering holes in the desert. That's where our people work. And they build a solar power plant near a watering hole, find Native American grounds, cost them a lot of money, they have to reroute the project, lots of delays and things like that. So th there's all sorts of environmental justice and, and cultural resource issues as well. And then there's the bigger question of what are we doing here uh, bulldozing carbon into the atmosphere? And there's a couple of papers that came out simultaneously in, in the late 2000s one from the Gobi and one from the Mojave, basically saying that desert system, ecosystems, not just for the organic carbon, carbon but the inorganic carbon in the, in the desert alkaline soils, is actually sequestering carbon at a rate that's similar to a temperate forest. So we're losing sequestration potential as well in this context. So can you guys see that? I can't quite make out the roots. Also, we're losing biological carbon. Desert plants spend a lot of energy and, and nutrients to actually have massive roots. This particular plant that follows the root um, is in a wash where the river was shifting, but we could find, we traced that about 200 feet, the roots from this tree. Water obviously is a big issue out there. Um, 
one to five gallons per panel per year. And for a project with nine million panels, that's a lot of water. Um, and solar thermal requires cooling, which is even more water. And then the biggest use of water actually is when they scrape the site, they have to, on a 6,000 acre site, they got to drive trucks across that whole area twice a day to comply with the Clean Air Act. So, all, when you're near these uh, desert pupfish, um, that raises all sorts of questions about whether or not you're going to affect the water table and another endangered species as well. Now, when it rains in the desert, it pours. So, here's the gen, uh, well, I should point out, you can see a, a, an alluvial fan up there in, in the kind of in the middle, up to the, toward the upper right there, and there's a project cited for that area. It hasn't been built yet. Here you can see a little downstream, there's sort of an alluvial fan here. You can see roughly the outlines for the Genesis project earlier. And this summer, you know, that's why I said it's ironic they call this Genesis, um, they, there's a massive flood in this particular area, and you can see it knocked over all sorts of stuff. So kind of a lack of planning, perhaps, in this case. Now, not all the projects being cited or funded through DOE loan guarantee programs are actually bad. Uh, the Agua Caliente farm, for example, has been cited on agricultural land, which raises some questions, but, but certainly in terms of, of water use, you've dramatically, even though you're using a lot of water washing panels, you've dramatically lowered the amount of water that's being used for growing crops down in kind of the lowlands of the Sonoran Desert. Um, there are other parcels available. So again, I'm trying to point out that this is an institutional failure the fact that we've driven these particular lands on the, on the public, on the public. Uh, we, we basically designed institutions to drive projects onto public land when there's lots of other degraded lands available. So this is the EPA's Repowering America program, which barely has anybody applying for any projects on it, despite the fact that there are about 1.7 million acres in California alone that are close to transmission and, and they could actually be putting projects on. So, Looking for win-win scenarios is really uh, what we need to be thinking about in these decarbonization strategies. And ultimately, you know, those of us who are, in terms of thinking about resilient cities and, and, and how to actually bring energy back home a little bit, we're concerned about cities overheating in the context of climate change, right? Why aren't we covering our parking lots and, and lowering the, heat, the possibility for the heat island effect? I have a graduate student who's working on this topic right now, um, looking at what the potential contributions could be. So, not to mention to get from 25 tons per capita down to one ton or two tons per capita uh, emissions, we have to do really dramatic change. More out of sight, out of mind energy out in some land, distant landscape is not going to really help us here. So, really to, to summarize here, um, decarbonization by de industrial, I'm sorry, by industrialization. Really, the questions that need to be asked is how? How are we doing this? What is the kind of institutional architecture? Um, and then, for whom does this actually benefit, right? Is this just going to benefit um, Bechtel and, and Dow, or is this actually going to benefit the, uh, the people who actually um, might need a little more help in this context? So, thinking about sustainability and just transitions, as opposed to just a transition to a decarbonized economy, I think is really important. Important, And it needs to be pursued with temperance and humility. You know, everybody got really excited. Oh, we're going to build all these giant solar power plants really fast. And, and who knows what, what, if we actually made a difference with those big giant power plants. Um, second question, I, I think, you know, one of my observations in this is that, go, so I'm here I'm speaking really to the eco-mod literature, the ecological modernization literature, right? So questions about governance often reflect larger trends, right? So we have this culture of speculative capital out there. And, and in many ways that, what happened in this solar space is actually mimics exactly what's happened a lot more largely in terms of wealth moving one way and risk moving the other way in this context. Um, and then there's the question of land grabbing. Right? We see that with, with a lot of the other energies, particularly biofuels, but in this particular case, you have a lot of public land being up for auction, and essentially companies were just going first come, first serve, and grabbing whatever they can. Now, there's a lot of emphasis in the ecological modernization literature on greening the state. And I would argue that greening the state is one thing, but greening the state in kind of this neoliberal era is another thing. And in fact, um, and it's made worse that when you don't, when you just focus on innovation as this kind of, let's dump a lot of money and help them, and they'll, the company will carry it forward and become successful businesses without marrying innovation policy and industrial policy. It's like, let's, let's promote rooftop solar so cylindrical. Right. Um, so, and then and the, the, the sum there is: is this a green new deal question or green question mark new question mark deal? I, I'm not quite sure that it act, 
that it is. I think that um, you might have to come up with another term for that. Um, and then lastly, questions about green civil society. So ecological modernization said there's a new role for NGOs in this context. And I have a stack of MOUs that project developers signed with Center for Biological Diversity, Sierra, Sierra Club, NRDC, promising not to sue on projects. So we have to think about how foundations are now driving NGOs to focus on carbon, 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 and lose sight of some of these questions about biodiversity, social justice, and things like that. So ultimately, and, and if you actually look at who funds the foundations and who funds it, many times it's the same people. So we're going to run into the, a real big loggerhead here at some point that we have to be, uh, I think, a little bit skeptical of. So that's all I have. Thank you. Let's go straight to questions. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I, I, let me talk to the first one first, and then I'll, well, let me actually answer the, the first question first, because I don't have a good answer for that. I'm, I'm trying to persuade my graduate students to actually look at that. There's a history of brownfield development being controversial because of liability issues. No one wants to take on a brownfield and then find some chemical that wasn't reported there, and then they have to clean up. So that could be one of the issues. Um, but it's, it's really a matter of cost right now. So land is a huge part of capital costs for these projects, because they're renewable energy systems. So um, when the public lands are up and they're pretty cheap, there's no reason for you to go on some place unless, I mean, unless you incentivize this better, you're not going to get anybody going onto those lands. And then the, the second point is, you know, through my research, I was going out to these sites often with NGOs, often with their lawyers. And they were like, we're going to sue these projects. This project's terrible. Look what it's doing to the tortoise. Look what it's doing to the Kit Fox, look what it's doing for the pronghorn antelope, and then comes out like a year later that they decide when the project gets approved, no one sues on anything. And then you know some of my other informants dump me a letter that says it's basically an agreement between the developer and the NGO. The NGO takes two million dollars. Developer says you sign this and we promise not you, that you're not going to sue. So essentially, the big NGOs are getting bought out in the context of decarbonization. So and here this is I'm talking about the Center for Biological Diversity, NRDC, Sierra Club, the big NGOs. Not the grassroots. So green civil society means there's different levels. There are activists who are actually working on this issue. In fact, there's a big split in the Sierra Club between the local folks who have spent their whole lives preserving desert ecosystems versus the and the big kind of climate change oriented folks at the top of that NGO opportunities for rentier behavior are endless. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a question for you about indicators. So I'm studying a country that's industrializing, studying Chile, where the question very much is we need energy to develop, and, and the country's really torn apart by this right now. I'm wondering if there's indicators for example, that would measure um, CO2 per jobs created or CO2 per new mine brought into operation. Because you talk about the shift from looking at the nation state to individuals, well, why, why not a shift looking at industry for the productivity rather than individuals? I think that's a great idea. I think that's exactly the sort of innovation we need. Um, so I, I think uh, CO2 by job created is probably a good place to start. Oh, I, in fact, the DOE Loan Guarantee Program, if you go to their website, that's how they have to report all their stuff. They have to report how many CO2 emissions they're going to save, and they don't include land use change, because I've talked to the guys who do the life cycle assessment for that. They do for biofuel projects, but not for solar projects. And um, they have to report the jobs created, the number of jobs created for the, these things. And you, they have really fancy maps, um, obviously. When you're giving out $20 billion, you could hire a nice graphic designer to represent these projects. But. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, more than that, I was thinking after you talked, Danny, that uh, in the last chart, 
like ultimate end of the of use of the energy. Um, and then linking with what Ali was talking at the beginning, especially with a, a microcent quote of uh, what is policy, if uh, you can start measuring the use of energy in, in because you know we are transitioning from industri uh, industrial use to transportation or you know uh, uh, other kind of stuff that uh, energy that is directly creating quality of opportunities, you know, because of the use of that, that energy in particular. And I don't know if there's someone, or, you know, that someone, or if that could be actually measured somehow, you know, like how, what proportion of the energy that we're using is um, not causing more industrialization, but rather some process of like gamifying kind of urbanization or people being able to have access to you know, public spaces. I think that's a, that's a great idea. Um, the, I think um, the the um, the connection. Well, I think back to Michael's uh, presentation about Oakland. In fact, several of the presentations, Tracy, others, um, uh, where. The demand, and this goes back to Halley's question, saying, um, should we be organizing around climate change? I think one of the points that development studies might make is that if we organize around people's needs, then climate change may be in a, 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 sensible, a sensible way of thinking about climate change. What can we do, given the real pressure to improve people's need, uh, people's capabilities in the, in, in the Amartya Sen sense? Um, and that's very, that's the danger. And I think one of the things that Ashwini Chatri is going to talk about this afternoon is the danger of the climate change rhetoric overwhelming the needs of vulnerable people. Um, and I, I think getting that balance right is very difficult, that trade-off right, because there are complex questions about, we think about these things too simply um, as just fuel sources or new technologies. In between, there's a lot of other things. So both Dustin and I, in very different ways, are looking at different elements of that chain. Um, and then somebody coming in thinking about urban environmental justice is putting a quite different way of thinking about that, which I think is enormously helpful, but hard for people concerned about development to take, a, take account of. Sorry, that's a, a, a long, wandering answer, but sort of got there. Yeah. And I, I can just, not completely related, but one of the things I didn't point out on the map of all the loans that were given out that w was that behind each one of those big power plants is Citibank, Goldman Sachs. So it's really ironic that you know these companies that won't lend anybody else money in the, in the economy right now are actually taking kind of risk-free loans from the federal government when, when we could have had a policy that actually put rooftop solar on every foreclosed house in the country or something like that and actually put the banks on the hook for actually the cost of those installations. So it's shifting the way we think about who benefits, I think, from these projects is pretty imperative. Yeah. It's just, just, you know, I, I mean, this is, of course, keeping completely in line with the, the speculative, <coughs> the, the chase for speculative investments that will return a few percent as compared to the zero percent that you get from, uh, you know, bonds and other kinds of, of uh, pieces of paper, right? So. Got going here are successive speculative bubbles uh, because various possessors of capital keep looking for places where they can get returns greater than zero. You know, and the whole sort of global economy is now operating on that. So it's not uh, unreasonable to expect that even if you've got this kind of industrialization that you're advocating that, that the returns would accrue to the wealthy rather than to the poor, right? And it raises this question of, you know, since markets don't seem to be reliable in terms of, you know, trickling down to the masses, and central planning doesn't seem to work very well either, you know, what is the nature of the economic system? 
that will provide those basic needs without that kind of rush to profit and return, you know, that uh, unreasonable profit and return. I think that's the dilemma, right? So again, it isn't the technology so much as the social innovation problem. And, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, so anyhow, uh, you had a question back there. Yeah, um, this is a question particularly for Justin that we both of you discussed in, in light of the industrialization uh, as a potential source of solution here. But I was thinking about the life cycle assessment for um, solar, and you and I have talked a lot about the end of life um, issues and the energy inputs into um, then re extracting these materials to reuse. But what's your take on um, the life cycle assessments you've seen, taking into account both the production energy? into um, creating these kinds of new technologies, as well as dealing with end of life, which then also, of course, relates to environmental justice issues of externalities of those processes of production and recycling. Um, and then, and coupled with that, then this drive to innovate um, a technology, a technological solution to solve this, and, and maybe not seeing all of those other applications, and are we not just sort of shifting uh, uh, one environmental problem for another yet again? Right. The very complicated question. Yeah. I'll do my best. Um, one is, is uh, one of the things I did with a big meta, it, for my postdoc at Berkeley, one of the things I did was a big meta analysis of all life cycle analyses on solar. And you know, one of the early conclusions that, that I drew, and it's pretty obvious, is that um, there are no lives in life cycle analysis. It's about matter, <laughs> material, energy flows, no people. You can't really think about how to insert people and think about environmental justice in that context. So you could have, yeah, so that, that's kind of the one aspect. In terms of the quality of the life cycle assessments themselves, um, my, my one observation would be that they don't include land exchange, so that's important. But kind of the, the more interpersonal level, all these LCAs are either done by companies or guys at national labs who actually own patents for companies and don't report it actually in their, their little bio at the end. They don't say, I have a patent for the recycling technology for this company. And so they're in fact, I've, I've reviewed papers by the, these guys and I've said to the journals, you guys should make this guy declare the fact that he's reporting on the technology that he actually has financial interest in and they actually don't enforce their policies, even though know, they have policies like that on the book. So I don't know if that answers your questions fully, but I, that'll be my first half, and I'll let you, know, you guys have any other observations on that. I, I, I think I'd only add to that that I think the social innovation has brought us a number of tools like life cycle which are in various ways crude and often um, poorly applied. But I think they brought a change in the, in the nature of the firm, particularly in uh, Germany and other parts of Europe. And the boundaries, the moral boundaries of the firm have been uh, expanded so that they have uh, uh, some responsibility in discourse for the beginning and end of I think we've got to go much, much more. And uh, the organizing in cities, I think uh, I, I have lots of questions about it. I'm uncertain about the nature of the knowledge that comes out of that. But I think it's quite important to get um, an innovation process to match the technological process. And maybe a part of that comes through organizing. Again, desperately incompetent system, but um, it sort of works um, and, 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 and I think is, is helpful because it, as it crosses the boundary that um, Jeff Berry mentioned, the boundary of political economy and STS, of the nature of knowledge and the objects of knowledge. So my assumption, and this is constantly refuted, but my running assumption is that sometimes grassroots community groups represent different forms of knowledge and different ways of getting to knowledge and in the process bring something important into the uh, innovation process. Yeah, and I, just to add one more thing, I mean, really two different things that are quite black box. One is the innovation process itself, which no one understands. I mean, you saw my linear diagram there and that's, that's the extent to which people think about that. That's all black box. But also the, the life cycle analysis um, their intention is to represent some object or something um, by a number. 
and that has a tendency to really obscure any other elements of, of what might be attached to the production of that element. So you might have, you know, first solar's cadmium telluride modules might have the ener lowest energy footprint of any solar module, but you got people working you know, with cadmium product inside of those factories, and particularly deeper in the supply chain. So um, any L LCA has, has in some ways, can work counterproductively to answering questions about environmental justice because, in fact, it obscures um, those kinds of representations that you might have otherwise. We have time for one more question, okay? And I'm going to uh, choose beauty over age, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a question for Ben. Um, I was wondering how you would take into consideration the histories of um, exploitation in the global context when you're considering industrialization and development um, from extractive resources, um, warfare, um, colonial, colonial, colonial legacies, and that sort of thing. What a lovely question. <laughs> um, uh, almost unanswerable. Um, but I think that, well, reparations don't work for all sorts of philosophical and historical re reasons that the people who did the damage are no longer alive. And we can't actually impose reparations upon their, their um, uh, offspring, their white distant offspring. Why well, not? Okay, so this is still a controversial question, so this is, this is excellent. Ronnie believes reparations might work. I've had classes work through it, and we've come to the conclusion that reparations don't work. But various sorts of... Um, I've taken a lot of uh, joy. I've taken a lot of joy out of the fact that some of the people tortured by the British under the Mau Mau in Kenya have been bringing successful lawsuits in London. So they're almost, they're pretty old, these people, but they're, they're making some, they're succeeding despite various interventions by the government in an attempt to shift it onto the Kenyan government. So uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's a, it, it's a really good question. My, um, uh, yeah, I'll show you. I'll just add, with, with, I don't have any answer to that, first of all, but what the BLM does, so I showed you pictures of Native American impacts. The BLM is supposed to have a, a, a prior consultation with Native American groups on public lands, even before it goes up for kind of the public to comment and things like that. So the institutional design is ultimately um, to offer an opportunity for Native Americans to collaborate or at least offer in, input into that process early on. Now, we're talking ultimately about the, the NEPA process, the National Environmental Protection, Agency, um, Protection Act process, where um, you could really argue that public participation under that rubric is more of a legitimation process than actually a public participation process. So I think um, the answer to your question is, is that everybody's failing at doing what you're asking in terms of evaluating it. I, I don't think that there's a, 